evening. Uh, my name is Jeff, and it's great to be able to share again as Richard and I continue to work our way through the book of Ruth. This is the fourth of those, and so if you've missed some of them, you can pick the others up online. And so turn with me to Ruth chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young woman you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning I will redeem you. Good, let him do it. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So, she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you were wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and it measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And help us now as we think about it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be honest, as I first read this passage, I was thinking that the title might be something like Racy in Ruth. It's certainly not the advice you expect to hear from a mother-in-law. Someone asked me recently what advice I thought a parent should give their daughter before heading off to university. Well, this wasn't it. Is this supposed to be a, a chapter that you don't focus on too long in Sunday school? Maybe it should have a PG rating right at the start. Well, maybe it's not quite what it seems at first glance. I want us to look out for three things as we work our way through this chapter together. I want you to think of her rest, reputation, and reward. Right at the start of the chapter, we meet Naomi again, and she has one thing on her mind, rest. Naomi wants Ruth to find rest. My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? And this word, Rest seems to follow us about in the book of Ruth, doesn't it? You might remember in chapter 1, verse 9, Naomi prays for her daughters-in-law that God would deal kindly and that they would find rest. Where did she expect them to find this rest? Well, she told us, each in the house of her husband. Remember, we said this before, but at that time, for a woman's survival, it was really important to have a husband who could provide for you. It was through him that you would have protection, provision, and promise of a future. This was the rest that she wanted for Ruth. And so here we are again, and the search for rest continues. Why? Because it's important. Life depends on it. The future depends on it. And nothing is more pressing than finding it. And there's something really attractive about rest like this, isn't there? 
It's like when you arrive home after a stressful journey and you sink deep into the armchair. And yet we all have a longing for rest that will only really be found in Jesus. Forgiveness of sin and a restored relationship with the Father only come through Jesus. The rest that Ruth and Naomi are searching for points forward to the ultimate rest found in Jesus that only God's people experience. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. And so I wonder, have you experienced that rest? Look at verse 2. Is not Boaz our relative with whose woman you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put your cloak on and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Well, let's start with the easy bit, the farming bit. Now, for those of us who aren't grain farmers, we're probably not overly familiar with this process. But once you've gathered in the barley, then you move to threshing. And this is where you separate the grain from the husks, often by beating it. And then winnowing is when you get rid of all the chaff. You throw up the grain and the wind blows the chaff away. It's long, it's hard, dusty work. I had a good laugh at one of the commentaries that I was reading uh, because the, the big concern that they had was why Boaz and his men would have been working late at night. It seemed that they thought the standard Dolly Parton 9 to 5 pattern applied to farmers. They clearly didn't know much about farming and especially about gathering in the harvest. I used to work for an agricultural contractor and so I know what those long hours look like. Although, to be fair, sitting on an air-conditioned tractor cab wasn't quite the same as what Boaz was experiencing. But look at what Naomi asks Ruth to do. What exactly do we do with this? Well, let's have a look. At the least, surely this is a very dangerous plan. Sending out a young Moabite woman on her own, all dressed up, into the darkness to meet a group of men. Remember, this is the time of the judges, a time which is famous for its wicked acts that took place. So there's little doubt that this is a risky plan. But I also think that it's not nearly as dangerous or as racist as we might first think. Because notice how Naomi finishes. She says, he will tell you what to do. You see, I think it changes when you know Boaz. When you know his character. We got to know him in chapter 2, didn't we? Boaz is a worthy man. He is a man of noble character. Naomi can trust Boaz. And maybe actually Naomi knows that if Ruth gets down to, the, to Boaz's threshing floor before dark, then she will be safe. She knows the type of man he is. Remember, a worthy man, a noble man, a godly man. And it's not just Boaz's character that shines through in this chapter, but also Ruth's too obedient and honoring to her older mother-in-law. In verse 5, all that you say I will do. And we see later too more about Ruth's character. And so Ruth carries out the instructions of her mother-in-law to a T. Boaz works, he eats, he drinks, and now he goes and, and lies at the bottom of one of the grain piles. Presumably this is what you did to, to spread out through the grain piles in, in order to protect it from being stolen. And Ruth does what Naomi told her. She goes across when he's sleeping and uncovers his feet and then lies down. And as Boaz sleeps, he either feels the draft or has tickly feet, a bit like me. And so he's startled in the night and he wakes to bizarrely find this woman at his feet. And you can kind of imagine his shock. Kind of reminds me of Michael McIntyre's Midnight Game Show. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's where someone in the family... Uh, gives Michael the, the keys to the house. And in the middle of the night, he sneaks into the bedroom with his whole crew. And then they wake you up and they thrust you into a game show there and then. Well, this was no game show. But there was indeed some questions. Firstly, from Boaz. Who are you? He says to Ruth. Seems to me a valid question. But notice Ruth's response. I am Ruth, your servant. 
Notice Ruth's identity is no longer tied to Moab. Ruth seems at home with God's people and happy to treat him with honor. But she too has a question, or at least an implied question. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. This is not some girl who's hoping to lead a man into temptation, but rather this is a plain and simple request, albeit slightly in an unorthodox manner. And the question is this, will you marry me? You see, this is a proposal. And she says, as she says, spread your wings over me or spread the corner of your garment over me. It can kind of be translated either way. She was really saying this, will you provide protection for me? Will you provide me with rest? And notice the link back to chapter 2, verse 12, where Boaz had prayed using that very same language, that Ruth would find refuge under the wings of God. You see, Ruth is saying to Boaz, would you be the answer to the prayer that you prayed? And look at Boaz's response. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not went after younger men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. What a response. Ruth, I, I'd, I'd love to do what you've just asked, because I know that you have a reputation and maybe Boaz has a message for some of the men out there. If you're dating a girl and you've got to the point where you believe that you'll want to marry her, well then, don't just hang about. Boaz doesn't seem to be a, a man who's going to encourage a long engagement, does he? And this kindness that Boaz talks of in verse 10, it's not that he was saying, Ruth, you've been so kind to me coming after me rather than uh, as, as an older man, but I think he was saying that your kindness to Naomi is even greater than your first kindness to her. Rather than going off with some of the other men in the town, obviously there must have been interest, you've gone for one of your family redeemers. In other words, you haven't just cared about yourself. You wanted someone who would look after Naomi too. Someone who, if God is gracious to grant it, may provide a grandchild for Naomi. If you are Married, I wonder, is your kindness to your mother-in-law something that people notice? And not just to your mother-in-law, but when you marry someone, you take on a responsibility to their family too. And then Boaz notes this. All the men in the town know that you are a worthy woman. Ruth's just been around for a few weeks and she's got a bit of a reputation. But what a reputation to have. You see, I think that as we look at the words and actions of both Boaz and Ruth, we see the lips and the hands of Christ. As followers of the Lord, they, they point us to his character, to his kindness, his goodness, his patience, his faithfulness. And isn't there something altogether beautiful about the God that they follow and reflect? Isn't this a God who draws you to get to know him? And if you're a Christian, is this the God that those around you see shining out in the way that you live your life? We've all got growing to do in Christ's likeness, of course. But don't you want to become more like Christ? Is it not an attractive thing to have this type of character? And for Boaz and Ruth, they lived in a time marked by evil and sordid living. What a contrast they must have been. How brightly they must have shone. And maybe the time of the judges isn't dissimilar to that of the nation we live in today. Jesus says to his disciples, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's get back into the story at verse 12. Maybe you're thinking that all seems too good to be true. And there is one thing. It looks like Boaz has already thought this through. And he knows that there's another closer relative who should be entitled to first chance to redeem this family. Notice even here the character of Boaz. 
This man plays it by the book. Even though he clearly has a love for Ruth, his love for God's law is greater. And so he says, lie down here till the morning, Ruth, and then I'll go and sort it out. In verse 14, morning, morning comes. They pack up quickly and Boaz is sure to get her off the threshing floor before people notice, protecting her reputation and his. But he doesn't send her away empty. He gives her six measures of barley to take home to the mother-in-law. Maybe it's a little sign to reassure Naomi. Don't worry. You may have come back empty from Moab, as she'd said in chapter one, but you will be taken care of. You're going to get your fill. So she heads home and explains all to Naomi with Naomi's response given in verse 18. Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Notice rest comes up here again, doesn't it? But this time it's with Boaz. And this time he will not rest. How does Naomi know with such confidence that it's going to be done today? Well, because she knows Boaz, and Boaz said so. Boaz is a man of his word, and that's an attractive thing, isn't it? When someone says that they'll do something, and you just know that that will happen because they've said it will. And you know why it's attractive? It's attractive because it's a godly thing. Now, I know that not everyone who keeps their word is a Christian, but they're certainly reflecting God. And every Christian should be someone who keeps their word. God says it time and time again. Just read the Sermon on the Mount. So in this sense, they already know that it's a sure thing. Ruth will get her reward. Ruth is guaranteed someone who is going to marry her. Now granted, she's not entirely sure who the groom will be yet, but we can probably see God's hand at work and and have a fair idea of where it's headed. Ruth is guaranteed rest. Protection, provision, promise of hope for the future. But although this rest is yet to come, she walks away with six measures of grain, a guarantee of what's to come, a deposit, you might say. And we too, if we are a follower of Jesus, have a sure reward of eternal life to come. We are in no doubt of the bridegroom's identity, though. It's Christ. For we, the church, are his bride. But just like Ruth was given a deposit that guaranteed what was to come, we too have been given a good deposit. The writer of Ephesians puts it like this. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. The Holy Spirit living in us is our deposit. Our pledge, pointing to what's to come. What a sure and certain hope. What a joy to be living with the Holy Spirit and to have the certainty of eternal rest in Christ Jesus. And so we're back to where we started, where rest should be at the forefront of your mind. Because your future depends on it. Have you secured your eternal rest through Jesus? Do you know the work of the Spirit in your life, the good deposit that promises your reward? And does your reputation reflect the God whom you claim to follow? Maybe that's a couple of questions that you can mull over as we finish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story and we thank you that you are at work through it weaving the story together with your good purposes for your people. And so help us to trust you in the midst of our circumstances and help us to hear what it is you're saying to us tonight through this passage. Amen. Don't forget to join us on Sunday morning at 11.30 for our online service. And good night.